Recently I published why Japan had no chance and some people asked for a basic guide on World War II ship classes. Something I had on mind for quite some time anyway. So let's take a short look at battleships, carriers, battle cruisers, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, escort carriers, destroyers, submarines and destroyer escorts. To give you a better feel on the relationship I use the visualized approach for the values. Here you can see the maximum values for the example ships chosen for this video. Thus you have always a reference to compare to. Usually the value is from the Yamato, except for speed, there it is from the Fletcher class destroyer. Although the topic is very complex, I tried to keep this video rather brief. And for those who want more, Justin and I created a more in-depth companion video. That is available on the second channel and idly watched after this video unless you have already a basic idea on all the classes discussed here. Now as always a bit of an incursive warning here. Quite often the sources differ on values, especially when it comes to displacement and complement. In particular the displacement values have to be taken with a grain of salt due to the many sources not specifying if they use short or long tons. I used long tons in this video, so however when I say tons or right taunts, it means long taunts. There are more issues with displacements, namely that there's full, deep, standard and normal load. And on top of that, some publications use the term maximum load, which is not an official term at all. Since I couldn't find a reliable source that had all values on the same load category, the displacement bar should be taken with a bit of leeway. Similarly for space issues, only the maximum armor values are shown here. For this video armor layouts can't be taken into account. So since we got those bar cards sealed, let's dive in. Let's start with the biggies, the battleships. This is the only class where we take a look at two examples. The first one is the Royal Navy's HMS Warspite. The Warspite was commissioned in World War I, yet she received a major modification in the interwar period that improved propulsion, armor and armament. It is very important to remember that it was not uncommon to have a World War I ship fighting in World War II. After all, ships are very expensive and take a long time to build. Thus the quote, naval strategy is build strategy. This was compounded by the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, which imposed strict tonnage restrictions and created a so-called building holiday for 10 years. Now on the other end of the World War II battleship spectrum is of course the Imperial Japanese Yamato. As you can see the values are quite different. This should come as no surprise since the Yamato was the largest battleship ever built and she was commissioned in late 1941 and thus one of the most modern battleships of World War II. It should also be noted that the Yamato was constructed outside the Washington Treaty regulations which limited the standard displacement of battleships to a maximum of 35,000 tons. Now let's take a look at the ship class battleship. There's quite a divide between the original purpose of the battleships and what they actually did over the course of the war. And this is clearly not limited to battleships. Tacticians had to adapt in the midst of the war so extensively that by the end of it no major category of warship except Minecraft was employed in the US Navy tactically for the purpose it had been built. As such we will first discuss the basic idea of the ship class followed by what it actually did. Battleships were both heavily armored and heavily armed. They were intended to fight against other surface ships, usually also battleships. And although the carrier was by far not so much ignored by the navies as often claimed, battleships remained the universally accepted measuring stick of naval power, which was precisely why they had been a focus of the 1922 Washington Naval Agreement. As such their intended main function was a primary combat role. Yet due to the vulnerability of battleships against naval and land based aircraft many battleships were pushed into serving in a support role, especially in the Pacific. Of course there were also traditional battles like the Hood versus the Bismarck. Yet then again the Bismarck's main mission in this case was not to slug it out with the Royal Navy, but to attack merchant ships as a commerce raider. Hence one could argue that the Hood also served in a support role namely to protect merchant shipping. Other examples are that some Royal Navy battleships served as escorts in convoys supplying Malta or as a covering force. This was not limited to the Royal Navy. Battleships were quite often used in support roles like covering fleets, patrol against merchant raiders, especially in the Pacific to provide fire support for amphibious landings and floating anti-aircraft batteries for carriers. 
which is still a better fate than that of the Yamato. She was nicknamed Hotel within the Japanese Navy due to her lavish, by Japanese standards, crew spaces and inactivity during much of the war. Yamato only fought in a single surface engagement, the Battle of Samai in 1944, before being swarmed by carrier aircraft and sunk in April 1945. Which brings us to the next class of ship, the aircraft carrier. Note that the US Navy shortcut CV actually does not mean carrier vessel, but the V refers to volair, which is French for flying, and the C still stands for cruiser, so it should be a flying cruiser. Here you can see the Tsukaku, a Tsukaku class carrier of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Considering the fate of the Yamato, the following line shows that not everything is as straightforward as it seems. In many ways the Japanese were in the forefront of carrier design and in 1941 the two Shukakus, the culmination of pre-war Japanese carrier design, were superior to any carrier in the world then in commission. Even if one does not agree with the superior statement above, it is without question that the Shukaku class carriers were very good. Now carriers were originally intended to be in a supporting role for the fleets. In the developing interwar plans, inferior navies, the Japanese when fighting the United States and the United States when fighting the British, expected to use aircraft to soften up and slow the enemy battle line. Although in 1941 the Japanese were leading navy when it came to naval air power, for all its striking power however, the first air fleet was still not regarded by the Japanese naval leadership as the main element of the combined fleet. According to Japanese naval orthodoxy, that role was still reserved for the big ships and big guns. And if you think about this, the Japanese carrier attack against the US battleships at Pearl Harbor, which were the main target of the attack, thus makes far more sense, cause from their perspective they were using their support force to strike the enemy's main force. Now as most of you know, in the Pacific the carrier became the main striking force. In World War II, aircraft became the chief naval weapon during daylight hours because of their effective range and their not limitless integral capacity for scouting, guidance to the target and coordination. Yet for the Atlantic and Mediterranean it was not so straightforward. British carriers in these areas often served in a supporting role. For instance, in one exceptional case, a Malta convoy was escorted by no less than five carriers. As such, they served in anti-aircraft warfare and anti-submarine warfare roles. In late war the British sent also a sizable carrier force to the Pacific that provided support for the invasion of Okinawa and other operations. This supporting role of the Royal Navy's carriers was mainly due to the balance of force, since the Kriegsmarine had a limited number of capital ships and the Imperial Japanese Navy in late war was mostly sunk. Now let's move on to the battle cruisers. Note that usually people use the shortcut BC here, yet the correct one from the US Navy is actually CC. Now what is the main difference between a battleship and a battlecruiser? Battlecruisers were armed with ordnance as large as that of battleships and displaced at least as much as later in order to accommodate larger propulsion systems. To allow for the increase in weight of the more powerful machinery however, the battlecruiser sacrificed most of the armor protection of the battleship. In other words, battlecruisers were comparable in displacements to contemporary battleships but generally faster and less protected and or less armed, depending on the navy. Only very few battlecruisers served during the Second World War since several were never finished after the Battle of Jutland in 1916, which saw several British battlecruisers exploding. Additionally, advances in propulsion in the 1930s allowed for fast battleships that did not have to compromise too much armor and armament. Their intended roles were commerce protection, commerce raiding and also surface combat. And if you consider the Shanos and Gneisenau as battlecruisers, then they pretty much fulfilled all these roles. If not, remove commerce rating. Now to the heavy cruisers. Here the short code is CA, which originally meant cruiser armored. Yet by World War II it meant heavy cruiser. In contrast to the light cruisers with the short code CL. More about them later. The name cruiser dates back to the age of sail. It resembles more of a function and capability than a ship type. Strictly speaking, in the age of sail the term cruiser was applied to any ship on detached duties. As such, a cruising warship had to have enough endurance, speed and armament to conduct independent operations or you could say it was capable of cruising around while still annoying the enemy. 
Now about the difference between light and heavy cruisers. This can get a bit confusing. There were two important naval treaties, the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 and the London Naval Treaty of 1930. Be aware there was another one in 1936. Now the Washington Naval Treaty limited the cruisers to 10,000 tons of standard displacement and a maximum of 203 centimeter guns. Yet there was no limit on the numbers of cruisers which resulted in a so-called cruiser arms race. Whereas the London Naval Treaty of 1930 introduced the distinction between heavy and light cruisers. Where light cruisers were allowed to have guns of 15.5 cm or smaller, whereas other cruisers were categorized as heavy cruisers and their numbers limited. Additionally, there was also a limit on total tonnage. Note that the accurate treaty does not include the word heavy or light. To quote the treaty, the cruiser category is divided into two subcategories as follows. A. Cruisers carrying a gun above 6.1 inch, 155 mm caliber. B. Cruisers carrying a gun not above 6.1 inch, 105 mm caliber. Generally, cruisers that were built along restrictions of naval treaties were called treaty cruisers. Officially, the Prince Eugen was a treaty cruiser as well. Yet, if you look at the displacement, it was clearly not. Of course, once the war started, and sometimes even before, these limitations flew out of the window. In general, around 112 cruisers, both light and heavy, were lost during the war. The intended role of heavy cruisers was to act as scouts for the fleet, defend sea routes, conduct commerce raiding, and also conduct major fleet action. Yet for the most part, the cruisers did not act as scouts, since this role was taken over by the carriers. There were a few exceptions, like the purpose-built scout cruisers of the Imperial Japanese Navy, Similarly, commerce raiding was for the most part conducted by submarines, so most heavy cruisers served in a variety of different missions, as Wayne notes, heavy cruisers designed in part for fleet scouting did nearly everything but that, like surface combat, commerce protection, shore bombardment, convoy and carrier escort. Next are light cruisers, for those I choose the Cleveland class, since it was the most numerous light cruiser built. As you can see, although a light cruiser, her armor values are higher than those of the previous heavy cruiser. Yet we need to consider that at this point the distinction of the London Naval Treaty was mostly irrelevant. Still, the Prince against displacement was considerably higher, so why does it have less armor? Well, first off, the Prince again was longer and wider. Second, it had a different armor scheme that covered more areas. Third, the US often used better production techniques and material. Also, the Cleveland was a bit younger than the Prince again. One key aspect of some, yet not all, light cruisers was the use of dual-purpose guns as their main armament, that allowed them to engage both surface targets and aircraft with their main batteries. Yet although nearly all navies tried this, only a few of them were successful until late war. For the light cruisers, the intended role varied depending on the different navies. The Japanese wanted to use them as destroyer leaders. Similarly, the US Atlanta class were intended as destroyer leaders as well. The British had a stronger focus on commerce protection, they also preferred lighter cruisers since they were cheaper and their empire was still quite extensive. Whereas the US and Japanese preferred heavy cruisers for this role. The Kriegsmarine built some of its light cruisers as Spielkreuzer scouting cruisers. Ultimately light cruisers performed a variety of missions ranging from service combat, naval bombardment and escort duty. In the Pacific, one very common rule for US light cruisers was a floating anti-aircraft battery, where the dual-purpose guns were very useful. Next are escort carriers. Here you can see a Casablanca class escort carrier, which was the most bruised carrier class ever built. Although it looks similar to a regular carrier, you can see it is a bit more stubby, but most importantly slower. As such, it could not operate alongside regular fleet carriers, unlike light carriers with which they should not be confused. Built initially atop Ryder House, these baby flap tops provided air cover for the convoys throughout the crossing, or at least it did so when the weather permitted. The small carriers embarked only a handful of planes, but they were newer US-made adventure torpedo planes retrofitted to carry depth charges. Now in our case, the load of 27 aircraft a bit more than a handful of planes. Since the Kazakh Blanca class is more on the top end in that regard, Whereas on the lower end, the number could be a mere six aircraft like the HMS Audacity, which was a captured German merchant vessel converted into an escort carrier. Unlike most other ships here, the escort carrier did not really exist prior to World War II, at least not with that function. Although many of the earliest carriers were similar to escort carriers due to them being converted from merchant ships as well. 
yet they were originally experimental carriers, not escort carriers. Now a typical mission for an escort carrier was, as the name implies, escorting convoys. Yet quite many were also used to ferry aircraft to the front lines and damage ones back. Furthermore, many of them served in providing air cover and air support during amphibious operations. For instance, four of these cheap carriers supported a landing near Salerno in 1943. Far more usually were brought as support at the invasions in the Pacific. So time to take a look at one of the most common ship classes out there, the destroyer. For this we choose the Fletcher class destroyer of the US Navy, because surprise it was the most constructed destroyer of the Second World War. Destroyers were actually a rather new ship class. This becomes more apparent if we look at the original name, which was Torpedo Boat Destroyer. So initially these ships were built to protect battleships and cruisers from those pesky little torpedo boats. Yet by World War II the destroyer was an all-around combat and support ship. By circumstance and organizational needs of Anglo-American navies during World War I, the destroyer had emerged from its original and exclusive torpedo boat destroyer function to become a check of all trades. It engaged more in defensive operations, escort duty, scouting, screening for the battle fleet, conducting anti-submarine warfare operations, then in torpedo attacks against the enemy fleet. So the destroyer's intended main role was to protect and assist the fleet in various forms. As such it needed seafaring capabilities and a proper range. Additionally it had to be able to engage surface, air and submerged targets. Hence a proper weapon and equipment loadup was necessary, thus the ideal destroyer was equipped with sonar, radar, depth charges, torpedoes, AA guns and dual purpose guns that could engage surface and air targets alike. As such the caliber was usually around 105 to 130 mm, since that allowed for manual and fast reloading, thus reducing weight and complexity while also providing a good rate of fire. This meant that destroyers performed the largest amount of different missions in the war, like screening for battle fleets, anti-submarine warfare, anti-aircraft warfare, torpedo attacks, picket duty, escort duty, surface combat, mine warfare, naval bombardments and many others. Due to this, their large numbers and their relatively small size, they also suffered a large amount of losses of almost 600 destroyers of all sides during the Second World War. Next is the submarine. Here you can see a Type 7 sea submarine of the Kriegsmarine, which served as the mainstay of the German U-Boot Waffe in World War II. Now it is important to remember that U-Boots, like other contemporary submarines, were not true submarines. Rather, they were really submersibles. Although their primary design feature was the ability to operate submerged and to deliver an attack from periscope depth, their diesel electric propulsion system was air briefing. Also the submarines in the Atlantic and Pacific were quite different. The German submarines were small compared to US Navy and Imperial Japanese fleet submarines deployed in the Pacific. For instance the Gato class had a length of almost 100 meters or a bit more than 300 feet. And although the submarines are strongly associated with the Kriegsmarine, at the start of the war in 1939, the Soviet, Italian and US navies possessed the most submarines with around 160, 100 and 90 submarines respectively. Now the intended roles for submarines were mostly commerce raiding, mine laying and scouting. Yet there was also a bit of variation dependent on the navy. For instance the Japanese intended to use their large submarines to weaken the US battle fleet. During the war the missions varied quite depending on the navy as well. The Germans from the get-go used the U-boats for commerce raiding and to a limited degree for mine laying operations. Whereas the US Navy initially used them for various missions yet soon focused on commerce raiding as well. The Japanese on the other hand had not only a large variety of different submarine types yet also focused more on engaging enemy warships than commerce raiding. Also differently to the Atlantic both the US Navy and Japanese Navy used submarines for scouting duties ahead of major operations. Now in the Atlantic U-boats worked the scouts as well in so called patrol lines for detecting convoys. Submarines performed various other roles as well, although to a limited degree, for instance transporting goods like supplying Malta or German technology to Japan. Similarly the Japanese navy used submarines extensively for running resupply missions to isolated and or threatened island garrisons as well. Another more common mission at least for the US was rescuing downed airmen. So it's time to look at the most common enemy of the Axis submarines, namely the destroyer escort, which is likely one of the least known ship classes here. 
It was like the escort carrier class that did not exist prior to World War II. Now it is important to note here that the destroyer escort, unlike other ship classes, was not a universally used class. The Japanese, for example, did not have destroyer escorts per se, yet ship types that performed similar roles. As such, we are speaking mainly about the US ship class here. The name of this class is similar to the escort carrier and for a good reason, if we take a look at the speed. You see immediately it is rather slow, thus it was not capable of supporting fleet action in general, unlike a regular destroyer. Similar to the escort carrier, this class was used to protect convoys without using ships that were capable of fleet action. Although it was slow compared to a regular destroyer, it still could match the speed of a submarine, its primary opponent. They were smaller than full-sized American destroyers, though larger than British corvettes. Armed with 3 inch guns, they were hopelessly underarmed for any kind of surface action, but with sonar, radar, depth charge racks and a hedgehog, they were immediately suitable for the anti-submarine mission. Note that the British called their land lease destroyer escorts frigates, likely to annoy anyone who likes standards and clarity, like me. Now for those who want to complain that I did not include the Soviet, French and Italian navies, their exclusion is due to limitations in time and reference books. Since this video took already more than 39 hours to make and after editing will be beyond 40 hours. Also I'm very certain that Justin will discuss at least the French and Italian navies as well in our extended version of this video, so be sure to check it out on my second channel. Finally a recommendation here, there's a YouTube channel out there that focuses exclusively on naval history. He is called Drache Finnel, I'll link his channel in the description, be sure to check him out. If you like in-depth research content like this, consider supporting me on Patreon or alternatives linked in the description and pinned comment. Thank you here to Justin, Azumazi and Andrew for supporting me during the writing. Special thanks to Fabian for sending me a book that was used but not harmed during the making of this video. Sources are in the description, thank you for watching and see you next time.